Welcome everyone, I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our second book club event. And we are so thrilled to have Craig Grossi with us to discuss his beautiful book, Craig and Fred, a Marine, a stray dog and how they rescued each other. Craig is a, an eight year Marine Corps veteran, veteran and a recipient of the Purple Heart. Uh, after returning from Afghanistan, he worked for the Defense Intelligence Agency and attended Georgetown University. Um, he's the author of two books so far um, and spends much of his time traveling around with Fred, uh, inspiring others with their amazing story and their message of stubborn positivity, which we will be talking about. Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome Craig Rossi and Fred, who I see is right beside him. So hi, Craig. Hi, everybody. Hi, thank you again. Yeah, of course. It's really great. Thank you, Michelle, for, for all your hard work putting this together. And um, it's we're really, really excited, really excited to be here. It's it's a lot of fun. And Fred, Fred, don't let him fool you. He's excited too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, all right. So let's start off. Um, if you would please tell us this your the story of how you met Fred. I know most of some of us know, some of us don't, but I, I feel like it never gets old. So yeah, no, and, and, and yeah, I never get tired of never get tired of telling it either so yeah of course it was um 11 years ago it was uh on uh in october of 2010 um i was a human intelligence collector attached uh to a a a, a company of recon marines um so the, the way that works is just recon marines are the, are essentially like our special forces are some of our most highly trained elite um infantry in, infantrymen in the marine corps and Sometimes they need certain attachments, certain like Marines with different specialties to kind of go with them on their missions and stuff. And, and my specialty was human intelligence. And we were going into an area where we knew very little about the people, the Afghan people who were living there and what their lives looked like under the Taliban rule. Because one of the only things we really knew was that the Taliban had complete control of this area called Sangin. And there would there the closest unit to where we would be going was a a, a, um, a company of uh of regular or battalion of regular infantry uh from third battalion fifth marines and they were holding the district center of, of sangin and they were our only real basis for information and and just their experience on the ground was how we were kind of formulating what we were in for and um and it, it, it the picture was not was not pretty uh -huh. They, they, those, that, that unit at the time was was taking really heavy casualties um, and a, a lot of a lot of wounded just about every time they went on a patrol somebody somebody uh, got wounded or killed and um, and we would be going north of them um, by, for a, a ways up into basically into the where the Taliban we, where we thought they were and inserting out of, out of helicopters in the middle of the night and um, we would have to, there was no base, nobody waiting for us. We would have to kind of find and identify a, a safe place for, to hold up and make a, make a makeshift base. Um, and so that's exactly what we did. You know, and I remember the night, the night before we left, um, or the, actually it was probably the morning that we left, we were getting our, our final brief. And I remember looking around the room at, uh, as the intelligence analysts were briefing the, uh, our team and, and it was, I'm looking at all these recon Marines who have seen combat all over the world and, and multiple deployments. And it was the first time I'd, I'd seen any of them actually kind of nervous, like shifting in their seats and looking at each other. And I was like, okay, like this is, you know, we're really in for it here. And, and so we, in the middle of the night, we, um, we inserted out of the, the back of helicopters and maneuvered up to a, um, an abandoned home. And uh, the, the homes there are, they're more like compounds. They have the typically have like a like a 12 to 15 foot tall, tall mud packed wall, um, and then some dwellings on the inside, maybe like an orchard and the areas for livestock. It's typically what a home looks like um, at varying degrees of, of size. Um, and we found one up on a little hill, and we started right away. We started filling sandbags and just tossing them up to everybody on the roof, fortifying this this position as best we could because we we knew when that sun came up that they would be coming for us they would know where we were really quickly and and um i try i try hard in the book and and in, in my talks to to really paint a uh a, 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 an accurate picture of what it was like in sangin um for us because 
not because I, I want to, I want to pat on the back or I want to, you know, impress anybody, but really just so we can all kind of understand what, what it was like for us as trained Marines to be there. Um, you know, and the stress that we saw, because that first morning they came, they came at us with everything they had just mortars, uh, RPGs, really accurate, small arms fire. And in, in, in numbers that nobody had ever seen hundreds of, of Taliban. Um, and, and with a lot of confidence that, that, that you didn't typically see from them. And, uh, and I try to I try to bring everybody there as best I can, because it was basically sun up to sundown for seven days, um, just constant fighting. They they were really wanted us off that hill. They knew we weren't a big unit, and that and that they, we were vulnerable. Um, and it was really just to the credit of of those those recon marines that I was really lucky to serve with that that we were able to hold that little piece of ground. Um, and in the middle of that chaos. Um, in the middle of, of, you know, just fighting for our lives and we would catch a little break here and there and we would be drinking water and, and, you know, kind of communicating with each other about what, you know, what was going on. We would see him, we'd see this, this funny little dog, you know, just kind of trotting around the battlefield and, and it would instantly just put a smile on our faces, you know, just looking at it. And, you know, and so I try to talk a lot about that and try to, you know, just paint that picture because, um, it's just so interesting to think about, you know, what, how we were feeling, the stress we were feeling, and then what the Afghan people, the people, the villagers who were caught in the middle of that fight, what they were feeling and the stress they were feeling. And then think about, you know, what, what Fred must have been feeling, what a stray dog in that environment must have been feeling, um, you know, in terms of just what, what his world looked like. And, oh, excuse me. Sorry, Ruby's over here kicking pillows at me. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, it, and it's, it, it, it was, um, you know, just a, a really uncertain, a really, um, unstable time to, to be there. And, and after about seven days, things calmed down and the Taliban gave us some space. Um, they gave us a little respect because, and, uh, and we were able to kind of take a breath and look around and I was able to actually do what I was there to do, which was to write reports. And so I pull out my computer and I start typing away, trying to get information about the tactics and the numbers and just everything I was seeing from the Taliban. Cause it, it was, it was, it was unprecedented. Um, and I see this little dog again, I see his tail kind of periscope across the top of my screen, you know, little hook tail. And, you know, and I, I'm instantly just enthralled and I, I put my computer down and I kind of watch him you know, and, and uh, he just let out a big sigh. He's heard this story a, a time or two. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, and, and I watched him for a little while and I, and I like to think at this point, you know, it, it, when I look back on it, um, I, I, think it, I think it was the little kid in me that always wanted a dog that kind of took over the, the reins uh, it, mentally for me because uh, a lot of people are surprised to find out that I, I, Fred is actually my first dog. Right. Uh, I, I wanted one really bad my whole life. And, uh, and I, I tried very hard to convince my, my parents, especially my dad, um, to, you know, to, to let me have a dog. And, and uh, but it, it, I couldn't get past the, the parental kind of roadblocks. And I think, you know, it was, it was that kid that kind of took over. And, and so I, I started walking up to Fred and, and all the stress and all of the environmental, you know, the heat, the, the combat, the lack of, of sleep and food and just, you know, it was all wearing on me. And, I, and mentally, I started to think like, don't walk up on this dog. Like he's, if you're in bad shape, if you're stressed out. Imagine how he feels. You can't just approach him. You know, and I was already kind of making up excuses for him in my head about what he was going to do. He was going to growl. He was going to snap, you know, and, and I got a little closer and he started to wag his tail. And that was the last thing I thought he would do. <laughs> and I got a little bit closer and I had a piece of beef jerky with me and I, I held it out and he surprised me again. He just, as gently as he could, he kind of accepted the jerky and chewed it very, very politely. And I, I swear if he had a napkin, he would have like dabbed the corners of his mouth. You know, he was just so <laughs> polite and so, so grateful. And I was just instantly sucked in and, and I wasn't a Marine you know, thousands of miles away from home on a, in a combat zone. I was, I was just a kid with a dog, you know, and, dog. The, and uh, that was uh, little did I know at the time that that was the beginning of, of uh, something really special. Yeah. Well, I know the, the journey to 
first get him back, I guess, to, to base camp and then ultimately get him home. It took like a many people involved, yeah. right? So oh, yeah. talk a little bit and, and a risk, big risk for, for you and, and for Fred. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Arguably, the risk was greater for for Fred. Uh, you know, but it was um, it, it the it was pretty obvious to to me and to the rest of the Marines that I was with that Fred was special. You know, and 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 we all kind of fell in love with him. And when it came time, we ended up being out there for uh, about 30, 30 days or maybe a little bit more. And the way we were operating was we, we would they would stick us out in a place like that for for about a month, and then they would come and pick us up. And bring us back to a big fortified you know american base called camp leatherneck um which by comparison to where we were in the field it felt like you know felt like the mall of america you know there was wi-fi and everything and a gym and you know all the trappings and comforts of home and um and we would spend about two weeks there and then go right back out the door um and so everybody started to kind of get in my ear about getting Fred out there because he it was kind of clear that he was my dog he was with me all the time he always kept track of me he was always sleeping in my sleeping bag and um you know and so and, and I was I was the intel guy I kind of had a reputation for for uh, just getting finding a way to get stuff done without necessarily right. asking for permission and uh and <laughs> um and so I love the idea obviously because I, I loved Fred and it broke my heart the idea of us getting on a helicopter and, and flying away and leaving him there. Um, but it was, it was a massive risk. And just the first phase of the, of his trip, you know, uh, was challenging enough, but then assuming I got him on the helicopter and back to Leatherneck, then what? Then I've essentially brought him from an environment that, yeah, is pretty dangerous for, for me and my fellow Marines, but arguably a lot safer for him to an environment that is safer for me, but is, lethal for him if he's caught if, if i'm caught with him he's put down no questions asked uh i, would I mean suffer. you were told that right you were told oh, yeah. don't approach, yeah yeah, right? yeah. 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 I, I would get in, i would probably have gotten in trouble you know as well um but it, it, i would have i would have essentially ended his life by trying to save it and okay. so yeah. you know as if as if that deployment wasn't stressful enough i i added, <laughs> added another, another layer to it um and so I left it up to Fred. I think I, I did what I think a lot of people might do. I, I didn't want to feel like I was taking him. I wanted to, it to be clear that he wanted to come. So I thought, you know, if he follows me to that helicopter, if he's not scared off by the rotors and the dust and the noise, you know, and, and he actually tries to move to, towards the helicopter with us, you know, I'll, I'll know that this is what I'm supposed to do. And, and, I, I wasn't sure what he would do, you know, and, and I just to be safe, I had a duffel bag kind of stuffed in my cargo pocket on my pants. And sure enough, that helicopter came down and kicked up all kind of dust and, and uh, you know, was making all kind of noise like they do. And, and I'm running towards the helicopter and I feel a little a little poke at my heel and I look down and, and there he is, you know, and he was terrified don't get me wrong he was he was not trotting to the towards the helicopter like he does to our truck now you know he was he was afraid but he was coming and my uh friend mark at the time he's a, a master sergeant he's retired now but uh, he was our master sergeant we call him top in the marines we call master sergeants top and he loved fred and he's just the kind of guy you're glad he's on our side he's a big big beautiful house of a man and reached down and grabbed Fred by the scruff of the neck. And all he said was, we're doing this. You know, it's like, all right, top people. <laughs> and I grabbed the duffel bag out of my pocket and we stuffed Fred inside and we zip it closed because right away from that first moment, getting on that helicopter, the, if anybody on that helicopter, that landing crew or that flight team saw Fred, that's, that was, a, the risk was instant because that could have started a chain reaction of, oh, that recon brought a dog out. That guy from recon had a dog when they yeah. when we picked him up and it could have started a spitball of uh, you know and and so he had fred had to had to take his first ride uh you know inside of a duffel bag and he took it pretty well and and it was this kind of combination of as as the helicopter lifted off i remember looking around and i saw all these you know we had been out in the field for a while so we had long beards and we were dirty and and you know covered in in, in filth and and i look around this helicopter and all my fellow marines all these big tough guys with all of our gear on and guns and everyone's smiling so big because they know, you know, that we got Fred, we got him, you know, wow. and it was kind wow. of, of 
And it was, it was like this great moment, but then it was instant panic because it was like, as soon as we land, it's on. Like I have to figure out what to do with him. And um, so you landed it, at your base, right? So just to right. explain to people, yeah, yeah. Landed, we touched down at, at Camp Bastion, which is the, uh, the air base attached to Camp Leatherneck. And um, I had called uh, on my satellite phone and arranged for two of my friends to come in a little pickup truck and pick me up right from the flight line. So I got off the helicopter, still had Fred in the duffel bag, and everybody kind of went over to this little reception. They had coolers of like with cold Gatorades and some pizza for us. And, and I had to just kind of ignore that as bad as I wanted a cold Gatorade and ran, ran kind of past it and rolled right into the back of this pickup truck with Fred and was like, let's go. And so we started driving to the other side of base. And incredibly, in those 30 days while we were gone, uh, workers from DHL, the, the international shipping company, had showed up and set up a whole compound on Camp Leatherneck with an office and a, like a forklift. And like they had the whole thing had, been, had just kind of popped up in the short amount of time relatively that we had been gone. And I saw the little sign that said DHL and I was like, that's it. Those are my people. I have to, I have to go talk to them. And you know, I went down the first time I, I stashed Fred in my barracks room and I went down and started talking to DHL and they're literally plugging their computers into in their office. <laughs> and I thought I'd kind of try to play it cool. You know, like, oh, you know, hypothetically, if someone had a dog, is that something you guys could ship? And the guy saw right through me was like, <laughs> how big is your dog? Bring your dog here. I want to see the dog. You know, I was like, all right. Uh, you know, so I, he, this guy, he, this guy gets it. And Fred, Fred kind of took care of the rest from there because he charmed all those DHL workers who were from uh, a couple different African countries, Indonesia and the Philippines, like they had all left their country to come and work on an American base and make, make extra money to send home, make money to send home and support their families. And, and, you know, and they could have, they didn't need to do that. They didn't need to take Fred on, you know, like their lives were challenging enough being away from home, you know, and, and, and just sending everything they made back to their families. Um, and, and, but they opened their hearts, you know, and, and brought Fred it kind of into their, into their little family. And, and they took care of him for weeks, um, because I, I ended up going back out into the field. And so he, they had, they had to keep Fred there with, with them. Um, and that was, you know, they, they, they really stepped up in, in a big way to kind of hide him in plain sight, so to speak. And we have an amazing video that we'll show in a minute, which is with DHL and with when you met Fred, um, which yeah. I'm just amazed that you have that footage. So yeah, um, maybe let's let's show that now. Give you a little break, but yeah, um, Kimberly, yeah. So it's it's a little grainy. Bear with us, but it's it's pretty beautiful. Yeah. What you doing, boy? You good boy? Huh? Yeah. You good boy? Oh yeah. You thirsty, buddy. before about how with your parents you always you're, with your dad you always wanted a dog and I, I read for, that you had said your dad said well I'm going to end up taking care of him I don't want to do that so this is a, a real case of that because I know obviously Fred went on ahead without you and it was what four months before you were able to 
come back. So That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so for, yeah. Dad's my dad's uh, predictions came true. Uh, yeah. He, he, obviously his big excuse was, nope. yeah, I'm going to end up taking care of it. If you get a dog, cause you're, you know, you can't, you can't handle the responsibility and, and uh, you know, years and years later, he, he ended up take, driving to New York city to JFK with my sister to, to pick up my dog uh, at customs. And yeah, and Fred and my dad had a wild four months until uh, until I made it home, and it's it couldn't have been a better, more poetic uh, ending to that, to Fred's kind of first journey. And that was your dad, by the way. I should say, in the, yeah, that photo right there. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was it like when when you did get back and, and your first you know reunion with with Fred? Yeah, it was great. You know, it was it it um, you know what I think everybody was just too emotional to have and this was back in 2011 when you know yep. phone cameras weren't quite yeah. the same and uh and uh but i think it was it was just one of those moments that everybody kind of just wanted to let let me and fred have and i came home and and uh my dad had kind of surrendered the basement over to fred just made like a little layer <laughs> down there and it was so funny he he bought him a kennel because i think you know when he would leave you wanted to put fred in the kennel because fred was he never went to the bath. He's never gone to the bathroom in the house. He instantly kind of understood that's not okay. Um, and uh, but he he was a chewer and he liked to chew on the door frames and just just eat drywall. You know, I think he was just thought it was how you get outside was just through the wall. And uh, and so my dad would put him in a kennel and I could tell he felt bad about it because he bought a kennel that was like for like a, like a mastiff. Like it was huge. <laughs> And so I, it was this huge kennel in the basement and I go downstairs and I hear his tail kind of hitting the, hitting the side of the kennel and I come around the corner and he sees me and, you know, I, I've never heard a dog gasp before, but that's exactly what he did. He like took in a big, oh. he was like, <gasps> and then just, you know, <laughs> I couldn't get it open fast enough. I got it open and he was all over me. And, and, uh, what was really special was, um, you know, after, after we played around in the basement for a little while, um, I just wanted to take him for a walk, just the two of us, you know, and, and growing up when I was campaigning to have my own dog, I would actually walk all the neighbor's dogs for free after school to try to demonstrate that I could, you know, uh, handle the responsibility. And, and so here, I, here I was years later walking my dog from Afghanistan on these same sidewalks and same little trails around the neighborhood I grew up, grew up in, you know, and so it, it finally, you know, had happened and, um, in a way that that I'm still, you know, uh, appreciating and, and just still so so blown away by. Um, but yeah, it was it was it really took so many people um, who could have very easily and maybe should have, uh, you know, kind of turned away from from Fred and from me and from our situation. Um, it would be on the DHL workers. There was a British uh, a British Army veterinarian who uh, gave Fred kind of a covert nighttime uh examination you know just to kind of give me an idea of how old he was and if he had kind of contracted anything from living on uh, you know living out on the streets and um you know and, and she didn't have to do that you know and, and that was that was amazing and um and it was just like person after person that wanted to help you know and, and it's another way that fred's story has over the years and the more i've read it and the and more i've shared it in, the, in writing the books and stuff that you know i've picked up on more and more kind of examples of um you know just the the the, the shared kind of compassion and shared kind of uh ability for us to to help each other you know when we see uh, an opportunity and and uh, i'm proud that our story can kind of be an ex a really profound example of that i love that um and also i i, I know so when you got when you did get back it you know the adjustment was was difficult so having him there yeah. helped um and and i would love to talk you know about like the stubborn positivity which is which is great as well so yeah if you just speak a little bit about that yeah of course it was it was a struggle you know i i took a page out of the the only combat veteran i really knew was from my my, my uncle john who's a world war world war ii veteran you know and, and growing up in the dc area there's a lot of military around um, you know, and so I, I, I'd known some, some veterans of Vietnam. My father was in Vietnam and, um, you know, and it seemed like you just didn't talk about it and you, you got home and you moved on. And, and, and so I thought that's what I was supposed to do. And that's exactly what I did. I got home, I got out within a couple of months and because of my intelligence training and, and experience, 
I got a job working for the Defense Intelligence Agency, you know, and, and so six months after being home, I had an, uh, an apartment, you know, in a cool neighborhood in DC, a new truck, you know, I had, I was back home, all my friends, you know, had kind of, you know, made their way back to, to the DC area, you know, I had Fred, you know, on paper, everything looked great, um, you know, but uh, a lot of the trauma, the loss of some of my friends and, and a lot of the the, the combat stuff that, that we had seen and done in Afghanistan, um, you know, I, 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 I just wasn't out running it. And, and the harder I tried, the more it seemed to kind of come back in, in bigger and, and, and scarier ways. And I was, I was drinking too much and, and just, you know, and all the, for all the wrong reasons. And, um, and it wasn't really until, and, and, and so even when it came to Fred at first, I didn't talk about it when people would ask me, which is constant, I, you know, cause he's such a handsome boy. Everybody wants to know what kind <laughs> of guy he is. And he just has this presence. I love walking him around New York because people, you know, New York, oh, everybody's, everybody's got a mission, you know, to, to get somewhere and you walk Fred around New York and I don't care how, you know, how, uh, how gristled of a New Yorker you run across, they, like they are instantly kind of drawn to Fred. And it's pretty, <laughs> pretty funny. And people's kid would ask me, would ask me on, on walks around DC, what kind of dog is he? What kind of dog is he? And, and I would, for a long time, you know, for the first year or so, when I came home, I would just say, oh, he's a pocket wolf or he's a, you know, Afghan <laughs> I make up a breed and people would kind of shrug it off and they're okay. You know, and, or they'd be like, yeah, I've heard of those. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and cause I didn't want to get into it. Um, but some, something, you know, kind of brought it out of me one day. I, you know, I was at the dog park and, and someone, you know, was like trying to start to guess, what breed he was, you know, and I was like, you know what, actually, he's from Afghanistan. So I, I would just stop, <laughs> stop trying to figure out what breed he is, because you're, you're way off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, they were nice about it, you know, and I started to, they wanted to know more. And so I started to tell the story more. And, and, and the more I told, the more I remembered. And the more I, I felt like some of the pressure and some of the anxiety kind of come off of my, my chest. And, 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 and it made me smile. It made me kind of smile to, to kind of relive that, you know, this part of, of my deployment. And the more I told it, the better, the, the more, you know, kind of significant it felt. And I started to see that those first moments with Fred were uh, like an example to me. Um, because at the time, you know, I was really frustrated professionally, despite having this job at the DIA, I felt like it was a complete dead end. I wasn't getting anywhere to go from the, the style of operations that I had had done in Afghanistan and to ha have a, a job that really mattered to the people on my left and right. And then to go to, you know, just a big agency where it felt like I was just throwing everything in a black hole. And it wasn't, I didn't get the, you know, the, where the feedback and, and um, that I, I had come to, to value um telling Fred's story felt like a way to really kind of re reconnect with that that feeling um and it became kind of I started to think about those first moments with him and how he had every reason to growl and to snap and to to you know try to get me to leave him alone and give him his space he was essentially a wild a wild dog um and he didn't you know and he wagged his tail and I started to think about what what that really means, you know, and what I would call that if I had to to call it something. And I was like, he's he's positive, you know, he's 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 uh he's got, you know, he's always wagging his tail. He's always kind of and, and dogs, that's dogs in general. They're always, you know, excited, you know, and uh and grateful for everything. Um, but he was like that in an environment where he had very little to be grateful for. So I, and, and and to be honest, he's a very he's he definitely got some hound in him. So he's definitely stubborn, you know? And so I, I thought it would be, it's kind of fun to, to, to take that energy that we, we put into being stubborn and that Fred puts into to being stubborn and, and put it into being positive, um, you know, instead of being stubbornly, you know, stubborn, you know, <laughs> stubbornly yeah. positive, you know, and, um, and it really just kind of started to play around in my head. And anytime I felt, you know, like I was, I was stuck or, or, you know, like I, you know, was, um, you know, for lack of a better word, just, a, you know, a waste of space or, you know, a loser after getting out of the Marines. And, um, you know, I would remember Fred and I would remember that he wagged his tail at me 
um, you know, when he had no reason to, and I would find a reason to wag my tail. Um, and I would find a reason to be grateful, you know, and, and I would reach out to one of my fellow Marines that I served with and, and, you know, and check on them and, um, you know, and, and it just became this, this kind of, this kind of philosophy that really started to kick, kick around in my head a lot. And it, it lifted me up and I started to think, you know, am I supposed to do something with this story? Is this story my new kind of way to serve and and i love the idea but it felt just com kind of irrational um and it wasn't until i left the dia and went to georgetown that i started to get really back in touch with myself and what i had to offer as a as a person and that was through writing uh, my first class at georgetown uh, was a writing class and everybody was kind of complaining about writing a paper every week and, and the, the, you know, the course load and the, the and everything. And I was like, I love this. I love that this, I love the idea of sitting down and, and putting my thoughts on paper. And it, within that, by the end of that first semester, you know, I, I had in my head that, um, this story that I love to tell to people at the dog park, uh, or anybody that looked, looked at Fred for, you know, long enough, you know, they were going to hear it. Um, you know, I should write it down. And man, when I sat down to write, I remembered so much more, so many more details that made me fall in love with my dog and our story <laughs> all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became really, really clear to me that uh, the reason I was able to pull it off when it, the odds were against us by a long shot, it could have gone wrong at any second. Um, and the reason that I made it home in, in one piece um uh was to to tell this story and uh and it's been made all the more clear to me over and over again since our since craig and fred has come out that that is that's exactly what we're supposed to do <clears throat> beautiful um can you speak a little bit i guess about just the process of writing the book um and your writing process in general um uh, yeah sure i i um you know, I think and you, you started in George at, at Georgetown and then, yeah, so out yeah. of that, you came up with it. Yeah. For me, my, my first, my, the first real challenge to writing Craig and Fred was myself, was getting over myself. I okay. talked myself out of it, you know, countless times. Um, everybody loves their dog. Everybody loves to tell the dog story, you know, like who you think you are, you know, and, and, um, that's, I think very much, uh, a mindset of a lot of people, but it's definitely um, something that I think a lot of veterans struggle with is is the idea of of kind of drawing too much attention to yourself. We're not really programmed to to do that. Um, and if it wasn't for my wife Nora, uh, really, you know, um, staying on me up and and reminding me that I am a I am a writer. I am a good writer. I mean, she was refer when people would ask her what does your boyfriend do at the time when we were dating she would say oh he's a writer you know and i'd be like don't say that i haven't written anything <laughs> but no you're a writer you know, that it seemed like a little thing maybe at the time but it was it was a, a big deal and and um you know if it wasn't for her i i would have i would have talked myself out of it you know um before i even put pen to paper um and she's she refused that but she's not on camera so she can't say anything <laughs> and, um, and so it you know that that was my first my first obstacle and then once I once I got over that um it really it really flew out of me uh you know I like to think that you know you and I, I think everybody has their their own methods and their own things that they need to 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 write um but I I would anytime I felt like I was making excuses for myself about oh it's you know, it's too nice outside today. I shouldn't, I should be outside or, oh, there's other stuff to do, you know, today. And you, you know, you make little excuses to kind of get out of, of, of writing. I would, there's a quote um, from one of my favorite philosophers that I picked up at Georgetown, Epictetus. He's a, one of the Stoics. And, and he says, if you want to be a writer, write. Like that's, it's, yeah. it's it, you know. And, and <laughs> it's that simple, right? But yeah, you know, it is, it's not, it doesn't require 
you know, the, the lighting to be just right and you have like a cup yeah. of tea and like, and it, those are all very nice things. And it's not, it, it's not <laughs> say that that's not what you should try to achieve every time you sit down to write. But if you have a story to tell, just sit down and, and tell it and, and write it out, even if it's just for yourself. So you can look back on it, you know, or if you just want to share it with, with a friend or a partner, you know, like that it's, when you do that, you, you, you know, you never know the impact that it will have on the person that's hearing it. And, and it's, it's, whether it's a painful story or, or a happy or funny story, it's, it, you're, you're sharing something about yourself and you're always better for it. You're always going to be better for it. And I'm just so grateful and, and blown away that, that our story has been able to do what it's done um, in the years since, since Craig and Fred was published. And, um, you know, and, and it is stubborn positivity is a, is a big, um, a big part of that. And, and it is this a philosophy that, you know, I think is, I think it, just to talk a little bit more about stubborn positivity. Um, I think it's easy to, to be um, optimistic and optimism is important, but a lot of times when we're optimistic, we're ignoring the bad things that are happening around us. It's like sitting in, sitting in, in the, you're in a house that's on fire and being like, everything's fine, you know, yeah. and just ignoring everything that's coming down around you. And to me, stubborn positivity is, is looking at that obstacle, looking at that thing that's, that's standing in your way and seeing that that obstacle is the path that you don't ignore those things and, you, you, and, and just hope that they go away or hope that, you know, whatever you're battling or whatever you're dealing with will just go away because you, you, it might not. And then if it doesn't, it's devastating. And, and so stubborn positivity is, is seeing the obstacle and choosing to wag, wag your tail at it, you know, and, and, and that's, that's, amazing. that's the, that's the kind of the lesson. And it's, it's not, it's, I need constant reminding of it too. You know, I think it's good that I, I get to tell this story all the time because I'm able to kind of keep it fresh in my, in my head, but you know, it's, it's not a, there's, it's not, you know, it's not something that you just have, you know, you have to constantly kind of remind yourself of it. And that's, dogs are great, great for that. That's great. Um, we have a few pictures. Let's, let's just show. Um, we have uh, your college days and Fred's college days. And Fred's, uh, I guess his first, uh, keg party we have yeah. over there um which yeah. is amazing yeah. that was so funny um, yeah i went to georgetown as well i was saying so i can relate to this like i've been to that exact yeah. <laughs> courtyard um yeah. and then your graduation which is yeah wonderful. that's really great yeah um and then we could just move on to that now it's the idea of traveling around and telling your story and the and the book so just yeah. being able to, to do that, which has been, and Fred's a great traveler, right? Um, but just yeah. traveling around has, has been been great. So talk a little bit about just about that or just, yeah. Yeah, of course, it's, it's uh, those, are great, those are great pictures, um, great examples, because because the one here, uh, that's actually my high school. And oh, wow. Okay. I was sitting in that auditorium as a young person. Uh, they had a... Um, you know, a, a, like a job fair and they had a bunch of people come in and there were no different branches of the military come in and talk to the students. And they all had a slideshow, they, you know, the army, the Navy, the, the air force, they all had slideshows and reasons you should join their branch. And the, the Marine was the last one to get up and he stood right there where I'm standing and he looked around the auditorium and was like, maybe three or four of you have what it takes to be Marines. If you think you're one of them, come talk to me. And he left and he just left a couple of business cards. And I was instantly like, oh, you know, I, I, he got me with that. That, that was, uh, <laughs> and I laugh now knowing that, you know, I, I, I guarantee you that he just was late for another, you know, appointment or something. And that was his little hip pocket <laughs> thing that he threw out to see if anybody bought it. But I, and I did. And, and, and for me, school, when, when I was those kids ages sitting in those, in that auditorium, school was, was a challenge. Um, I, basically got C's and D's all through high school, never really felt confident or comfortable in a classroom. Uh, the only thing I ever really felt like I understood was writing and, and storytelling. Um, and, but, you know, it was just kind of a constant challenge. And, and growing up where I grew up, like a lot of communities um, around the country, you know, it's, it, it, if we put a lot of pressure on, on students to kind of have, a, have it figured out. Um, and in the DC area, you know, my, my, friends seemed like they had 
at least the next 10 years of their lives mapped out by the time we were, you know, juniors. And they at least knew like what colleges they were going to go to and what they were going to study. And I was like, I might not even graduate. I don't know what college I'm going to, you know, what yeah. college, why would I want to sign up for four more years of school? I, I don't like this stuff, you know? And, and it was really frustrating because I, you know, I, uh, I, I loved school. I loved, you know, meeting, making friends and connecting with people. And, and uh, I, I never had a problem, you know, showing up. It was just the, the grades, you know, like the amount I, I, you know, I would stay after and retake tests and try and try and try. And the, still the best I could get was, was C's and D's. And, <laughs> and that's exactly what I said to, to the, the kids that, um, you know, when I came back and, and to talk, to talk to the school with Fred, when my first book came out, I said, I can guarantee you I'm the first D student to ever come back and, and talk <laughs> to the school. Uh, Cause we were there for two, it's a huge school. We were there for two days talking to the whole school and um, you know, and, and I wanted to, to, I'm proud to, you know, that I ended up going to Georgetown and, and uh, I made the Dean's list at Georgetown, you know, and, and, and really for the first time in my life felt comfortable and confident in a classroom. And, and I just, I'm proud to kind of be an example of, you know, if you, if you're a young person or a person at any stage in life, you know, you don't have to have uh, it, it all figured out, you know, it's, it's okay. Very important. Yeah, no, that's very important. Um, all right, so I know we're getting a little bit short in, on time. I want to definitely get save some time for questions. Let's just we'll go through. A, we have a few more photos, which um, just to tell everyone, um, Craig and Fred were honored um, in 2018 by AMC um, at Top Dog, and here's you know Fred and Craig and hobnobbing with celebrities. That's Bernadette yeah. Peters there, um, and as well as um, a Kate Coyne, who's uh, AMC's president and CEO and and our chairman of the board as well so um but yeah that looks really fun like go to the next one we can go oh I'm sorry and that's let's go back one sorry let's give give Nora there's Nora and Ruby. Yeah, Ruby. Um, we'll get more to them later as well um yeah there's just there's so much there's a lot to talk about yeah, but, I know. Um, okay. talking, but... <laughs> yeah all right the next one um just is, is on stage at, at Top Dog um which was really yeah great um okay uh let's yeah there you go oh, I <laughs> okay so now let's talk a little bit about the now it's, this is your next your follow-up book has been out um which is also fantastic um just Thank you. Talk a, hopefully we can get you back again to talk about that one so yeah i'd love to yeah it's it's um you know it's, it's very much a, it stands on its own you don't have to have read craig and fred to to pick up second chances i I would always encourage people to, to read Craig and Fred first, just to get the full kind of arc. Um, but it is, it's, it's uh, kind of the next chapter uh, of, of my journey with Fred. And we ended up um, speaking at uh, the at Maine State Prison. It, it, it's otherwise known as Shawshank. Um, it's the, the prison that's portrayed in, in Stephen King's uh, Shawshank Redemption. And we heard it through, kind of just through, the, we live up in Maine now and we heard kind of through the main the main grapevine about the warden up there, who's a, a an Iraq War veteran, an Army Army veteran, and um, that he had done a lot of really incredible things. And but among so one of them was he had brought in um, dogs to, that from America's Vet Dogs to be trained by the inmates as service dogs, and that he had created a a pod or a, a cell block they call them pods. Um, that was exclusively for people who had served in the military for, for veterans. Um, and it, it was a, a really, you know, as kind of an incentive to, um, to, to, to live in this, in, in this one pod, it's one part of the prison with veterans. And, you know, we heard just that he was an incredible guy. His name is Randy Liberty, which was, you know, oh, great. speaking in itself. And so I went up there to, to speak to the veterans pod and they had all the, they had the book club up there had read, read Craig and Fred and, and after that, just that first day up there, um, I knew I, I had to go back, uh, which was not something I thought I would feel, you know, and, and but there was something about the environment, about Randy, about the, the men that I interacted with and about the, seeing dogs, you know, and men interacting with dogs in that environment, um, you know, it was just an incredible thing. And, and I, so I started a writing program. I started going up there every week um, to try to give what I had, what I had gotten and what I get from writing um you know to to these to these men who who are in prison um you know so I, I started just with a little little um 
prompts every week to, for them to give them opportunities to tell stories. Great, great. Okay, let's go to the, the next one and we can, you know, and then your wedding as well. So if we can just mention, yeah, um, very exciting, uh, just this yeah. past August. Yeah, the wedding was great, yeah. The best boy, I think you call him. Yeah, that's right. right. And it, he was the ring, the ring bearer too. The ring went right there on his, uh, both rings went on his little collar there. Yeah, he did a good job. Okay, so uh, we'll go to the next one. And this is the last one. And and by the way, I wanted to say that Nora uh, Parkington and her sisters, the song that was, that played underneath the video early was their song. So yeah, yeah, that's it's, right. it's really, I think it's great as well. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, so thank you, thank you again. Um, let's see, so let's go, we do have a bunch of questions, um, a lot of questions. So um, let's see, so this is a good one. What, what would returning veterans rather hear as a person, like, thank you for your service? You know, do you, and I know you had uh, some thoughts on, on, on that, yeah. that, especially after the withdrawal or, or just, yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it's, I think thank you is, thank you is always appreciated, you know, and, and um, I think you don't even need to say thank you for your service. You can, if someone shares with you that they served, you know, just a sincere thank you. Um, mm -hmm. It's great that just that phrase kind of just kind of bounces off people, you know, as much as yeah. people are tired of saying it, veterans can get our little fatigued with hearing it. So I think uh, for me, I like hearing just a sincere thank you. And, thank and, you. and then I, I, I always encourage people to, if you have time and it feels um feels right you can ask a ask you know just a simple follow-up question like what did you do in the military mm -hmm. and what are you working towards now um because you never know you know what how you might be able to help that veteran if they're if they were you know in aviation uh or something yeah, they had some specialty that you maybe you're familiar with in the civilian world you might be able to help them you know with a a, a reference or a job connection or or just some advice about if they're trying to get into, you know, real estate or something, you know, um, or the arts, uh, you never know how you can help. So it just, you know, just a simple, what did you, maybe what did you do or how long were you in and, and you know, what's next um, is That's great. Really opens up a dialogue, you know, and, and uh, it, it will make that, that veteran kind of feel like they have an opportunity to share, um, you know, without people just maybe making assumptions about, about them. I think there is people are uh, like afraid to ask those questions as they don't want it to pry, but I think it's people appreciate it. That's one of the things about you know, your book and just dogs in general really expose this, you know, the just military life or just, you know, to a different group of people to dog lovers. So it just is a view into that and, and another amazing, you know, important part about your book. Um, let's see. So, oh. What a, everyone's like, what a beautiful, sweet boy. Yeah, um, every, yeah, everything. Yeah. Oh, oh, this is a good one. Okay. What happened at customs? And oh, was there any quarantine requirement? Great question. Yeah. So he was, he, as far as the paperwork was concerned, he was quarantined. Uh, uh, in reality, he, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, he kind of, actually, yeah, it's true. He, for about three weeks at DHL, he was, pretty isolated he didn't interact with any other dogs um but uh, if you do it properly uh you know they're supposed to be vaccinated and then quarantined for 30 days after vaccination I and mean, that just wasn't possible um and so i did have to get a little creative with the paperwork um and it was a tense moment at customs when you know my dad describes it really well but he said they were like they're looking through glass through a glass window at jfk and there's people's rugs and boxes of wine coming through, you know, stuff's getting shipped. And then here's this big kennel, you know, with this little, you know, dirty dog inside of it. And the, the, everybody is kind of like, what, what is this? You know, they start looking <laughs> through the paperwork and my dad's like, oh no, like what happens if there's a problem? And they just keep him on that side. And, and he said, the lady kind of looked at Fred, looked at the paperwork and just kind of shrugged and stamped it and sent it, sent him through. And so it was, it was kind of the last, um you know a little piece. turtle or yeah yeah wow it, it, it is true because it's like if you had one person who didn't like dogs or something you know it could have it could have wiped yeah. the whole thing out and there's, organiz yeah. there's, there's organizations now that um that, that yes. been the time that can help help uh troops or people overseas get get dogs home uh, 
Yeah, can you talk a little bit about that? I, we do have a question about that as well. If there yeah. are any you know, suggestions or about helping other soldiers able to have their adopted dogs brought home. Yeah, um, there's a puppy rescue mission um, is great and they have, they have volunteers. They have basically a volunteer network all over the world of people um, who can take kind of take the dog off the hands of the the service member, which then removes the the complications. Like then it's not technically their dog anymore. It's like now in the hands of this foster, you know. And and then they can they can arrange for the paperwork and and all, all the transportation and stuff, and kind of leapfrog the dog across the globe. To wherever that service member uh, you know home of record is or home where they're stationed at um, stateside or, or elsewhere um so there, there's there's different resources S -E, um the aspca has an international wing too that i uh, that has done some some great work and so there's there's just more resources you just and they're a lot easier to find now um than they were back back in 2010. yep um okay how old do you you think how old it is I, yeah that yeah. question. And then there, someone's guessing it. I know everyone loves to guess about the breed. Someone thinks he's part bond lab. One thing that I think is that you haven't bothered to do the test. So maybe you should talk about that as well. Yeah. You know, I, I haven't, I haven't bothered to do it. It's, it's, I'm intrigued. I can't say I'm not intrigued, but I also just kind of love the mystery of Fred, you know, and, mm -hmm. and I can tell he's definitely hound because he's very loud and, and stubborn and, and, um, and he's definitely a shepherd because he's. I would watch him herd goats and sheep, and and now he's he heard and all of you, right? Yeah, yeah. All of those, yeah. Those, yeah. Those, yeah. those those shepherd kind of instincts, and um, you know, maybe someday we'll do we'll we'll do the DNA. But I I I like, you know, just kind of Fred being Fred. He's um, his own own breed, yeah. Fred. He's just a Fred. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. And then the age wise, you were. Yeah, I think I think he's probably pushing 12 at this point um if because he had all his big dog teeth in october of 2010 um and so that puts him from what i've heard from veterinarians you know around the eight month mark um and so he could have even been a little older than that um he hasn't gotten a lot bigger he's just kind of you know got some more muscle on him um but it's not it's not like he got taller <laughs> he's his little legs yeah you're and, right yeah what like his adjustment with food or with other dogs or just what was that like yeah it was it, it was you know it was an adjustment um he he got his butt kicked at the dog park a few times just because okay. i didn't okay. figure out what that he could play you know and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a competition um but that it didn't honestly the and with food it didn't take that long it, you know less less than a couple months for him to realize i'm getting fed we're, we're good you know and um and uh it was more I think just uh, just getting used to being on a leash, and uh, the challenge for me was always getting him to come. When I would go to the dog park and let him off, to get him to come back was was. Uh, Which is like every dog owner. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and yeah, right. to be honest, it's still a challenge. If he if he yeah, really yeah. is on a scent, uh, he you know I'm going where he's going. It's not not the other way around. Yeah. But he so I know he has a sister. Yeah. Ruby, right. Ruby. So yeah, he's Ruby. She's right here. And then we'd love to meet if Nora wants to come say hello. Yeah, hi, babe. Oh, oh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay with that. Yeah. Hey, I'll scoot this back a little bit. There we go. There she hi. is. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you guys are wonderful, and we're so happy to have you, you know, oh. here with us and to, to share this really beautiful story. Um, Nora, do you have any any thoughts so about how Ruby and you know when you guys met, or just anything you want to share? I wanted to share how much I can see because Ruby had oh, two, that's nice too. She had two major surgeries um two years ago yeah. with ANC. And yeah. that was like the first big injury we've ever had with our dogs. Yeah. And um it was just such a blessing. She's she tore both her um it's a blessing that we had ANC. Yeah. And we um Dr. Hart, right? Dr. Hart. Hart. Dr. Hart. Dr. Hart. Yeah. I highly recommend Dr. Hart, but yeah. she um she tore both her ACLs and she's running faster than she did before. Yeah. So we're just she really is. Yeah. She's a little wild. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we love we love yeah. everybody yeah. and everybody everybody just from Dr. Hart yeah. down was even just, just so, like, like handing her off in the emergency, you know, yeah. we had to that was so hard. Yeah, and, yeah that's right. The tech the vet tech was just <laughs> was so, so you know, sweet to her and, and 
she felt comfortable yes. in that. that good, good. It's so incredible. What's so that? We have questions about see. sorry about the mural behind you. That seems. Oh like yeah. Is that yeah. yeah. I'll show you. This is a uh, a really beautiful example of of I, I like to think just what can come of of sharing your story. Um, you know, and because this is something that I never imagined we would we would receive. Um, but it was from a college in Florida, uh, Florida State College in Jacksonville. Um, we went down there to the Cole College, read the book, and we went down there to speak. And they had uh, an art show with uh, different veterans art, a Vietnam era veterans art on display. And they walked us through the show. And at the end, they had this on the wall and they pulled the sheet down and this was underneath it. And, it was, it, and it, what it is that is um, wood carvings, wood, it's all wood etchings. Each and, student had one wood etching. Yeah, it's all divided up yeah. into like puzzle pieces. And each student That's did a different, a different section of it um, based the on their impressions from the book, like a, a part of the book or a message from the book. And then they put it back together and rolled ink on it and then laid a, uh, laid a, uh, a canvas down to make a, a print and the and professor a, made the land cruiser yeah and the land my land cruiser's front and center which makes me very happy <laughs> yeah, yeah it's amazing yeah and um i know you guys you live up in maine now right and mm -hmm. enjoying time your time up there yeah too, love, right so I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, great. yeah it's uh oh, let me, i'll pick up fred now now. here see if he'll okay it's, hello Oh, he's, like, he's very he's sleepy. Very sleepy. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> What's up? Buddy? He's so tired. Why are you so tired? Because he was. Yeah, he was outside a lot today. It was snowing. Yeah. <laughs> he's very sleepy, he and he said, just ate. Yeah, he just ate. He usually takes a nap after he eats. There you go. You're waking up. Um, but yeah, we love. A great we, yeah. yeah, we've got we've got you know a good piece of property up here. He's got plenty of room to roam and chase critters and. Um, and we have lots of fun dog friends up here. Um, if, every, if anybody's familiar with dog named Stella, she's a very, very funny lab that does some, some great, some, his, her owner does some really funny videos on, on social media about her. Fred is, we have a question about Fred's Instagram. So we will send that out tomorrow to everyone great, who asked great. Fred the Afghan. Yeah. And it's phenomenal. Yours is great too. So, oh, thank you. Yeah, this is really good. And there's a lot of wisdom, I was saying, you know, he really imparts a lot of wisdom to everybody. Yeah. So. yeah. Oh, Stella and Mabel, we're hearing from some. Yeah, that's right. Stella yeah. and Mabel. Stella. Yeah, Fred loves them. Oh, yeah. oh, this, is, this is really so great. So I know this has been just a long event, a long night, a lot of talks, well, but we so are fun. so grateful. Um, yeah, so just I want to thank you, thank you both so much, and thank you, Fred and Ruby. Um, you know, just for sharing this story. I also just want to thank also Barbara Ross, who we love, and you know, for helping to get this together, and and Kimberly Young, and as well, um, and obviously to to Craig and Fred to sharing this this beautiful story, and to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, and we wish you a very very happy holiday, and we will see you in the new year. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much.